Today we're going to talk about an experiment that was simultaneously both extremely easy and very difficult, and took me five years of messing with it to finally make it work. And to be honest, I think it's some of the finest wizardry we've done on this channel. It involves some of the most interesting physics I've ever worked with, and produces conditions that over the span of a fraction of a millisecond range from potentially minus 269 degrees to upwards of 10,000 degrees. So what on earth am I talking about? This is a flask of plain, reverse osmosis water. There's nothing else in it. No dye, no other chemicals, nothing. Stuck to the bottom is an ultrasound transducer. Basically a special plate that will vibrate at whatever frequency we drive it at. The more power we put into it, the stronger those vibrations get. We need to drive the transducer at the resonant frequency of the flask. Think of this like how an opera singer breaks a wine glass. If you hit the resonant frequency, it will vibrate in response very strongly, and in the case of a wine glass, eventually explode and break. With everything tuned and the strength of the vibrations perfectly set, we suck up a very small amount of water and let a drop fall back into the flask from an inch or two above. When the drop hits the water, a little bubble is formed and shoots down into the flask. But then something weird happens. Rather than floating back to the surface or popping, it just sits mid-water, suspended by the vibrations. This is the same way that acoustic levitation works in air, but using a bubble underwater instead of a piece of styrofoam. Now all we do is turn up the strength of the vibrations a bit until we hit this sweet spot between trapping the bubble and popping it. Finally, we turn off all of the lights in the room. After a few seconds, as your eyes adjust, if you look where the bubble is, you'll see the damn thing is glowing. It looks as though somebody has plucked a star out of the sky and contained it in the flask. It's really quite beautiful. But of course, our bare caveman eyeball can't compete with a hunk of silicon, so a two-minute exposure with my DSLR and you can see the glowing bubble clearly as well as the flask. Remember, there's no dye or chemicals making this glow. All of the energy for the glow comes directly from the sound waves we're sending through the flask. This is appropriately called sonoluminescence, or light from sound. In this video, we're going to go through how I did this, as well as why it took so long to make it work, even though the setup itself is actually really straightforward. We're also going to look at how this glow happens, as up until now, 13 different theories have been proposed to explain the glow, and to this day, not everybody agrees. Of those 13, most have been largely disproven, but there are still fervent supporters of even those that most agree are incorrect. Only two remain, and we'll see how both paint a very strange picture of what's going on. First, how did anyone figure this out in the first place? As you can imagine, there is no way that anyone would have thought to trap a bubble like this and then wait in the dark to see a glow if they didn't already suspect something was up. The first instance of this was by H. Frenzel and H. Schutz in 1932. They wanted to see what effect ultrasound had on developing photographic plates, but when they took the plates out, they noticed that there were distinct areas on the plates that had been exposed and looked fuzzy. Eventually, they realized that the areas in the ultrasound bath they were using where the pressure was highest was where the plate was getting developed. It was eventually established that under sufficient acoustic pressures, something called cavitation happens. Basically, the sound shoves the water so hard that little bubbles form and then violently slam closed again. A great demo of this is to put a piece of aluminum foil in an ultrasonic cleaning bath. The cavitation bubbles that form will literally rip holes in it as they expand and contract over only a few seconds worth of exposure. This old Tony did a great demo of this and I've linked to it in the description. So as people started to explore this more, they eventually figured out that if you just trap a bubble of gas with the sound waves like you just saw, you can make that single bubble repeatedly expand and violently compress down on itself over and over again. They found that as the bubble is compressed, it eventually releases a single flash of light for every acoustic cycle. Then it expands, bounces a couple of times, and then the cycle starts over. Now, the first thing that got me interested in this wasn't actually anything to do with ultrasound, but instead with the internet's favorite murderous crustacean, the mantis shrimp. These angry little bastards have the most devastating punch in the entire animal kingdom, and can accelerate their little bowling ball hands with the same force as a 22 caliber bullet. When they punch things, the impact is such that it violently forces the water out of the way, and you get a cavitation bubble. And sure enough, you also get a flash of light. Think about that for a second. This little rainbowy bugger can literally punch things so hard, light comes out. Oh. 
Another similar species, the pistol shrimp, can shoot a jet of water out of its claw, and it too produces both a cavitation bubble and a flash of light, and it uses the shockwave created to stun its prey. Lots of other things produce cavitation bubbles too, including the impeller on submarines. They produce long streams of bubbles, which actually cause enormous amounts of noise as the bubbles collapse and release little shockwaves. So tons of research has gone into how you can reduce this to make subs more stealthy. When I first heard about this, of course it was down the rabbit hole to learn where that light comes from, and fast forward five or so years later, I can now recreate it in a flask of water. Now, for those of you that saw my cold fire video, you know that it took me 18 attempts to get a torch that worked and produced the beautiful glow of cold fire. This project dwarfs that. I've long since lost count how many flasks I've stuck transducers to to make this work, and how many hours I've spent in the dark staring at an empty flask of water. The issue is that there are several tutorials online, but they all rely on doing this in the most difficult way possible, and rely on using materials that are only sold from a single company in Germany that isn't super keen on selling you things. When the reality is, most of that doesn't matter, their methods are overcomplicated to no real benefit, and this can be accomplished far more easily. The other issue is what I call Mount Stupid. Basically, when you're trying to learn about something weird and niche like this, you don't even know the right words to look up to find the information you need. And when you're working from YouTube videos recorded with a rotten potato and tutorials that use materials you can't get, that's an issue. So hopefully, this video will act as a starting point that others can build on and give you the tools to explore this weird and wonderful phenomenon. One of the biggest things that made this work was actually a moment of serendipity. As I was struggling through this, I got an email from the great people over at circuitspecialist.com because they wanted to sponsor a video. They wanted to send me one of these amazing frequency generator oscilloscope multimeter things. And they wanted me to do a giveaway of a few of them to my subscribers. I cannot express how lucky this was, as this tool single-handedly was the most important thing for making this work. You can actually do the entire experiment using just this as both your signal generator and oscilloscope, but for the sake of convenience, I'll be using a second oscilloscope to make this a little bit faster. Because of how finely you need to tune the whole setup, having a great digital signal generator like this is absolutely mandatory, and considering I was using this awful analog thing from the 1950s before this, it was a lifesaver. So stay tuned till the end of the video where I'll be giving away three of these to a few lucky subscribers. But if you can't wait and just want one now, use the coupon code THOUGHTEMPORIUM to get 10% off site-wide. And best of all, I've been working with them to put a special page together where you can buy everything you need to do this experiment, and has all the calculators you'll need to make some of the components we'll talk about in a moment. Some components, primarily the amplifier and transducer we'll talk about, are on order and will be available soon on that page. Link to everything in the description down below. Honestly, I love this thing, and will definitely be using it for a lot more future experiments than just sonoluminescence. But for now, that's what we're going to be focusing on. The oscilloscope works remarkably well, it can produce a huge assortment of signals, and works great as a multimeter. Medi over at Electroboom has also used one of these before for another really cool sonic experiment, which I've linked to in the description. So, we've got the thing that will generate the frequency we need, now the trick is to amplify it and then feed it into the ultrasonic transducer. Speaking of which, I'm using these dirt cheap ceramic transducer discs that you can get on eBay for a couple of bucks. You can also just get one of the big horn transducers that we've used in previous videos, and they work just fine. The frequencies we're going to be using are pretty close to the audio range, specifically about 27 kHz. So a cheapy audio amplifier off Amazon was all that's needed to do that. I'm using a 100 watt one because I wanted to make sure I had enough power, but a much less powerful one works just fine. In the end, we're only really using 6 or 7 watts of power, so it's largely overkill. I did, however, add an extra bit of heatsink so I didn't fry the transistors, as it did like to get pretty warm. So, we've got our signal generator, our amplifier, and our transducer, but if we tried to just connect them up, nothing would happen. The issue is that we need a higher voltage to drive the transducers, and they behave like a big capacitor. So, to drive them properly, we need to use a resonant circuit. It's the same idea as resonating the wine glass, but just with electricity. To do this, we're using a simple LC circuit, which consists of an inductor, or a coil of wire, and a capacitor, in this case the transducer. One of the most helpful things to pick up to make this easier is an LCR meter, which can measure capacitance, inductance, and resistance. I happen to already have one, but Circuit Specialist carries them if you need one. One of the issues with the tutorials I mentioned is they use special tiny transducers from that German company, but the capacitance of those transducers and the capacitance of the cheapo transducers that I'm using is not the same. So trying to work off the values in those articles will get you nowhere. 
but by measuring the transducer directly, we can figure out what its actual capacitance is, and then build our circuit around that. Since we know approximately what frequency we want, about 27 kilohertz, and now we have a measure of the capacitance, in this case 7 or 8 nanofarads, all we need to do is plug that into an LC circuit calculator to tell us how much inductance we need to make the whole thing resonate. In this case, it said I need about 4 millihenry, but that'll just be a ballpark. In the end, after tuning, I found that I only actually needed about 3 millihenry. We can then take this number into an inductance calculator and figure out approximately what size coil we'll need to give us this inductance. The inductance of a coil is set by a few different values. The first is the length and diameter of the coil. The next is the number of turns of wire and its thickness. And the last is something called the magnetic permeability of the core of the coil. Basically how amicable the core is to letting magnetic fields pass through it. The permeability of air, for example, is basically 1, whereas the permeability of something like ferrite or iron can be 300 or higher. Rather than trying to make the perfect coil, all we have to do is get it below the value we need when assuming there's nothing in the core except air. Then we can slide in a piece of steel, iron, or ferrite to slowly raise the inductance until we hit the value we need. I ended up using 28 gauge wire and wrapped about 200 turns of wire around an empty spool. As I went, I just checked the inductance occasionally with my meter as experiment is always better than trying to calculate it. When I hit the value I wanted and could insert a steel rod to get that 4 millihenry value, it was ready. I added a piece of silicone gasket to the top of the coil so I could slide the metal rod in and out and it'll hold in place once I've got it where it needs to be. Now we can wire everything up. To help prevent unnecessary EMF radiation interfering with nearby electronics, I used 50 ohm coax that I normally use for my radio stuff as my wires. Here's a wiring diagram to show how everything is connected. Basically, the frequency generator is fed into the input of the amplifier. The output of the amplifier is connected to some coax, and the central line is connected to the inductor we just made. The output of the inductor is connected to another piece of coax, which can then be connected to our transducer. Connect the outer shields of both pieces of coax together, and make sure the connections to everything are solid and there's no shorts. Before we actually connect the transducer though, we need to mount it to the flask we're going to be using. I mainly focused on replicating what the papers and tutorials used, so stuck with a 100ml round bottom flask. The transducer was epoxied to the bottom and held in place until it cured. Once the transducer is epoxied on, solder a wire to each of the two electrode pads carefully, and then short the two wires to dissipate any charge that built up from the transducer deforming from heat. However, one of the papers I linked in the description showed that the flask really doesn't matter, and managed functional sonoluminescence in an old school coke glass and even said they managed to make it work in a wine glass. I tried both of these, and while I did manage to trap a bubble, I couldn't get mine to glow. I think it totally would work if you had more patience, but by the time I tried this, I was pretty sick of sitting in the dark staring at bubbles, so gave up. Point is, the round bottom flasks are nice and easy, but if you really want to wow your science fair judges or PhD advisor, try it in a wine glass and don't think that the flask really matters as much as some papers would have you believe. But of course, changing the shape of the flask and water level will mean messing with the tuning to get it to work. Speaking of which, to monitor what's going on in the flask, I broke one of the transducer discs, soldered a wire to either side, and then epoxied it onto a random spot on the flask. This will act as a microphone, and we can use it to measure the sound levels and see how things are working by connecting it up to an oscilloscope. Which again, if you don't have a separate one, the scope built into the frequency generator works great for this with a bit of patience. Okay, with that we're almost ready to go. The last thing we need to do is degas our water. If there's any dissolved gas left in the water before we add it to the flask, it will cavitate all over the place, messing with the resonance and preventing the bubble from getting trapped properly. The easiest way to do this is to boil our water for 15 minutes at a rolling boil, and then let it cool with a lid on the container so it forms its own vacuum. However, I'm inherently lazy, and a much more efficient way to do this is to use a little vacuum pump. I'm using a cheap one-stage rotary pump I got on Amazon, and it works great. Just let the flask degas until you don't see any more bubbles forming. Since I'm using reverse osmosis water, it helps to add a stir bar or boiling chips to give the bubbles a place to form easily so this goes faster. This is especially important if you plan on boiling it. If you also let it stir while under vacuum, it goes even faster. Speaking of water, reverse osmosis water isn't strictly necessary, I just used it to eliminate as many variables as possible. Distilled, or in some cases even tap water should work just fine, just as long as there's absolutely no debris or dust or dirt as this will ruin the effect. 
Once your water has been degassed, it's good for a few days, but considering it only takes a few minutes to re-degas it, and the effect is much easier when the water is fresh, I just make fresh stuff every time. Okay, we're finally ready. Tip the flask and pour some water in down the side, careful not to make any bubbles by accident. If you do make bubbles, gently tip the flask back and forth to get rid of them. Fill it so the flask is full up to the neck, but not further. To hold it, I made a little mount out of a piece of acrylic and wood that would allow me to suspend the flask by resting it on its upper rim, without squeezing the neck. But it's not strictly necessary, and the usual claw-style retort clamps work, just don't tighten them down very tight and hold the flask as loosely as possible. Now we start tuning. Set the oscilloscope to 1 volt per division, and the frequency to around 25 to 27 kilohertz. Have the power on the amplifier about halfway up. Now watching the oscilloscope, adjust the frequency until you see the signal on the scope grow as big as it's going to get. There may be several frequencies that do this, but check them all and figure out which one gets you the highest amplitude on the scope. Then once you've found the resonance point, slide the metal rod in and out of the inductor until again the amplitude is as high as it's going to get. If the signal on the scope goes off scale, turn the amp down a bit. If rather than getting a nice clean sine wave, you get weird bumpy peaks or the trace isn't particularly clean, there's still gas in your water and it needs to be degassed better. Another test to see if things are working properly is by gently squeezing the sides of the flask. If it massively changes the amplitude on the scope, you're probably near the resonance point. Now adjust the amplifier until it reads 3 volts peak to peak. If this doesn't happen, either you're not at the right frequency or your inductor isn't at the right value or your water isn't degassed properly. Adjust until it works. When everything is working properly, you should be able to control the amplitude you read on the scope by just throttling the power on the amplifier, and should be able to raise the amplitude until it goes all the way off scale. If you can do this, it means everything is tuned properly. Adjust it back down to 3 volts and we're ready for the bubble. Using a clean pipette or eyedropper, suck up a small amount of liquid and let it drop onto the water. It helps to have a light shining through the side of the flask to make it possible to see when this works. If everything is done properly, you should immediately see the bubble get trapped mid-water. If it shoots off to the side, you're not at the right frequency, and you need to find another frequency that gives you a bigger peak. If the bubble disappears instantly, the power is too high and you need to turn the amp down. With the bubble trapped, slowly turn up the power. As you approach about 4 volts, there'll be a point where the bubble suddenly vanishes. Turn the power down a hair and make a new bubble. If it gets trapped, you're ready to take the picture, or at least look at it in the dark. If not, turn it down a bit more and try again. Now, the hard part is that all of the devices we're using are chock full of lights and LEDs, so we need to cover all of that so we can see the glow, as it's extremely dim. We're done with the scope now, so that can be turned off. The screen and light of the frequency generator should be covered with something very opaque. The light on the power supply I'm using to power the amplifier and the power indicator light on the amplifier itself also need to be covered. Then find and get rid of any other lights in the room. I also set up some foam walls around the experiment to shield it from other stray lights, as the hackerspace I work out of is chock full of LEDs because, well, nerds love their LEDs. Set up your camera and you're ready to take the photo. Kill the lights and take as long of an exposure as your camera can, or just wait a minute for your eyes to adjust and you should be able to see the glow. The first time I did this, I was using my Nikon D3200 and even with the 30 second exposure, the glow was pretty dim. But to be fair, the lens I have for that camera is pretty cheap and slow. But it did manage to capture the glow. What is helpful is to have a remote shutter release and take even longer exposures of a minute or more to capture more light. But once I had this working, I just switched to my new far superior camera, which is a Nikon D750 and a much, much better lens. With this camera, I could see the glow even after a 6 second exposure, but I still took long exposures so that you could see the glass of the flask, and it doesn't just look like a white dot on a black background. My best shot was taken with a couple minute exposure so the glow was super obvious, and the flask was nice and clear. A quick note is why some of the other tutorials about this just really aren't great. While they do contain a lot of decent information in many of the papers and those tutorials, rather than using a single transducer like we used here, they used a pair of them facing each other on either side of the flask. The problem with this is that if there's any irregularities in how they're stuck on, and if they aren't perfectly lined up with each other, it's essentially impossible to trap a bubble, and the whole setup is much, much more sensitive to being bumped and the tuning. Whereas with my setup, once the bubble is trapped, even if the flask gets bumped a bit as I go to remove the light, the bubble stays trapped and settles after a moment. 
With one transducer, you only need 10 hertz of resolution on your signal generator, but with two, you need one hertz of resolution. Really, it's an absolute pain and there's no real benefit, so don't bother. Just use a single transducer unless you're some sort of masochist that likes watching your experiment fail a thousand times. Okay, now that it's working, we can finally talk about what's actually going on, starting with the most popular theory. The short version is that as the bubble compresses, the small amount of gas inside the bubble gets very, very hot. At the moment of peak compression, about 7 to 10,000 degrees by most estimates. This turns the tiny amount of gas inside the bubble into a hot plasma which emits a flash of light. This is known as the thermal plasma theory of sonoluminescence. Some of the other now discounted theories include weird quantum fluctuations, charge buildup on the inner and outer surfaces of the bubble, and lots of other weird effects, but the data just doesn't line up with those theories. Specifically, the thermal plasma theory was up until recently the only one that could explain the spectrum of light that comes out of the bubble. By most accounts, the light is a nice, smooth, blackbody spectrum you'd expect from a tiny dot of hot plasma. And most of the glow comes from a little bit of noble gas that's in the air naturally, and that is what's doing most of the glowing. Because of the extremely high temperatures, some groups thought that you could even use this to generate nuclear fusion by subbing out the water for deuterated acetone. But basically every study that tried to replicate that idea came up empty. Not only that, but the professor that originally claimed fusion was eventually found guilty of fraud and messing with the data and was eventually stripped of his professorship and barred from getting federal funding. But here's where it gets weird. The hot plasma theory relies on the light coming out at exactly the moment of peak compression. But now enter the newest contender, the cold gas theory. Basically, the researchers behind this theory contend that if the light doesn't come out at exactly the moment of peak compression, then it can't be hot plasma as you'd expect it to get brighter as the temperature rises, which is what would happen as the bubble compresses. Instead, they contend that the opposite happens first. As the bubble expands, the gas inside cools very rapidly. They predict to about 4 degrees Kelvin, or minus 269 degrees Celsius. This freezes the gas suddenly, but the gas molecules still have residual energy as they weren't frozen a fraction of a second ago. They then posit that the residual kinetic energy gets stored by the electrons of the gas. As the bubble begins to compress and the temperature rises past about room temperature, the electrons release this stored energy as a flash of light. And then as things compress, you eventually still get the hot plasma, just no light emission. Personally, I like both ideas, and can't really say for sure one way or the other. Both make great stories, and fit the data pretty well, but to be able to figure it out, we need more people to precisely time when the light occurs, which is part of the reason I'm making this video. I have neither the time or patience to do that sort of testing, but I'm hoping this video will inspire the next generation of physicists to tackle this problem and finally figure it out. To close out, let's look at what happens when you mess with the liquid and use something other than pure water. The literature claims that if we sub out the water entirely and use concentrated 96% sulfuric acid, the glow is supposed to be 3,200 times brighter. But I could never get it to work. No matter how long I left my sulfuric to degas, it just kept bubbling and never degassed enough to try it. So for those of you who know how to handle this stuff safely, it's something you could try, but obviously exercise extreme caution. In theory, if you get it working, the temperature at the moment of peak compression is much much higher than in water. Some estimates put it at around 75,000 degrees. Also, I should mention that anything other than pure water will resonate at a slightly different frequency, so you need to retune everything. To that end, even just the temperature of the solution also changes the resonance, so you basically need to retune the whole system every run to make sure it's all working properly. And the colder your liquid is, the brighter the glow is in theory. Another thing to try is dissolving salts in the water and seeing how that changes the bubble's glow. The only one of these that I tried was sodium chloride, but I don't think I had a concentrated enough solution to really see any effect. One of the papers I linked in the description shows the glow gets a distinct orange from sodium emission, so that's something that could be fun to try if you replicate this. Since the glowing bubble should release UV light, a friend suggested that I try adding some fluorescent dye to see if it makes the surrounding water glow. I just dipped a yellow highlighter into the solution, and when I fired it up, it did kinda seem like the area around the bubble was glowing slightly, but again, it was really hard to tell. Up until now, we've only talked about single bubble sonoluminescence, and normally, putting in more power just pops the bubble and ruins the effect. But if you keep adding more and more power, you eventually get multi-bubble sonoluminescence, which is exactly what it sounds like. You use a lot more ultrasound power and can make multiple bubbles glow, though each bubble will be much dimmer than the single bubble we used here. 
but also you risk exploding your flask if you're not careful. Normally, this is done with a RAM-type ultrasonic probe like we made in a previous video, rather than strapping the transducer to the flask itself. I've included a ton of papers and other resources in the description for those that want to learn more, as I had to leave out a ton for the sake of time and my own sanity, including using sonoluminescence for all kinds of cool chemistry and other liquids and variations. There's a chance we may come back to this in the future, but honestly, the main reason I did this was so I could finally stop thinking about it, as it's been knocking around in my brain for five years. That, and so there's finally a decent resource so other people can pick up where I left off. And honestly, as amazing as it is, I'm glad to be done. If nothing else, I think this will make an awesome science fair project for those of you interested, or maybe the center of your PhD dissertation if you're really interested. But for me, it's on to the next projects, and I can't wait to get started. And now I can add Capture a Star in a Flask to my list of wizardry. Finally, let's talk about the giveaway. Thanks again to Circuit Specialists, I'm giving out three of these amazing devices, two to the general audience and one to my patrons. All you've got to do is go to the link you see on screen and sign up with your email. By doing this, you'll be signing up to Circuit Specialist mailing list. They have a huge selection of awesome electronics, meters, tools, and more, and I can't recommend them highly enough. And remember, if you use the coupon code Thought Emporium, you get 10% off. The winners will be announced in the next video, and I wish you all the best of luck. For those of you who win, and even for those of you who don't but feel like replicating this experiment, when you get it working, tweet it at me so I can see. I'm excited to see how you tweak the experiment, what other liquids you try, and how your results differ from mine. And again, if you go to the link in the description, you can get all the electronics you need to perform the experiment, and then all you need to do is get the flask of your choice to complete the setup. And that's where I'll end the video. As always, I need to say a huge thank you to my many patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that give me the freedom to bash my head against hard experiments like this, even when they fail a hundred times. So if you'd like to support the show and want to keep the flow of science videos coming, consider kicking a buck or two my way. If you enjoyed, you know what to do. Subscribe, ring that bell, hit the like button, and leave me a comment with what experiments you think I should try next. And if you want more science and want to see these projects long before they end up in videos, be sure to follow me on my other social media platforms. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.